it's International Water Day, and we're here with a whole variety of, of fascinating scientists and water luminaries, and we're going to have a very good discussion about the consciousness of water. And I'll start off with some introductions. So we on the call here today, we have Nassim Harriman, widely considered by many people, including myself, to be the world's greatest physicist. Oh, and doing yeah, for, for real. Um, you know, I think, up to that. <laughs> honestly, and I think we've got some things coming from you soon, Nassim, that are going to change the world as we know it. So. I'm very excited. Coming yeah. out soon. That's 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 really going to shift the paradigm. And on the call as well, we have uh, William Brown, who is a biophysicist and really one of the most uh, knowledgeable people about the physics of the body. And we've had a lot of opportunity to talk about water and how water exists in the body and the role it serves. And we've learned so much about water and how it exists in the body from Dr. Gerald Pollack. I think, again, widely considered by many people around the world to be one of the most important water researchers that's really changed our thinking about water and, and introduced the concept of it having a fourth phase. And so we'll want to hear a little bit about that from you, Dr. Pollack. And then one of my co-hosts here is Stuart. Stu and I go way back, you know, good 20 years, known each other. And uh, both of us have a passion for water. I'm a medical doctor and I've been studying water and how it plays a role with our health in the body for at least the last decade. And uh, so I'll let Stu in make the rest of the introductions. Thank you, Dr. Beth. I just want to first invite saying that um, I want to bow in deep gratitude to water as we start this and honoring the sacredness of water and the fact that we all are connected in water and um, the humility I have and respect I have for the power of water and the people that are here that are so passionate about water. So I'd like to invite you all to get to know each of us and Clee Irwin and I are dear friends that have known each other for about five years. And Clee and I met through a, a Sabbath ceremony and found our deep passion and connection for water together. And Clee is an extraordinary entrepreneur and visionary who started one of the, the most successful supplement companies, Irwin Naturals, and had, I'll call it an awakening in his life over a decade ago to realize that he was here for a higher purpose. And that purpose was to really understand and map consciousness. And Klee has dedicated his life to understanding consciousness through creating a foundation called the Quantum Gravity Research Foundation. And we'll be hearing more about there and the work that he's done on consciousness and how it relates to water. We also have Dolph Zatigny with us. And Dolph and I have met recently through mutual friends and Dolph is an extraordinary businessman and leader who's had great success in the business world and has, I'll call it, expanded his knowledge from business and technology into water and the vital role that water plays in our lives in not just business, but in our daily lives, in our health, and in our brains and in consciousness. I'm so excited to have Dolph share with us um, his, his brilliance and passion. And this is all a lively discussion for us to all be together talking about the power of water, the consciousness of water, the quantum dynamics of water, and for each of us to interplay and, and um, say things that maybe we haven't said before, but this is a safe environment uh, for us to share, share what we feel and what we think about water. Thanks, Stuart. So maybe we'll start off with um, Dr. Pollock, because uh, like I said, he's been so influential to all of us. Tell us a little bit about the fourth phase of water, how that exists in the body, and what where your research has gone since you published your last book. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Beth. Uh, yeah, I, I'm happy to go there. So I, I think a 
uh, many of the people who are uh, tuned in uh, are not so familiar with with the fourth phase. And uh, so why, uh, what is the fourth phase? Uh, why do we need a fourth phase? What's, what's the evidence for its existence and why should we care? Uh, so uh, the idea of a fourth phase actually is not at all original. It started with, with a famous colloid chemist from more than a hundred years ago, Sir William Hardy. And, and Hardy said, uh, you know, in, in, in brief, there are so many observations that don't fit into the paradigm of the familiar three phases of water, uh, solid, liquid, and vapor, that, uh, that there must be something else. There must be, uh, uh, I don't know that he put it exactly in terms of fourth phase, but something, something like that. And, and over the years, over the, uh, the, the century uh, that came after uh, Sir William Hardy, there have been many people who were talking about a, a, a different kind of phase of water where the molecules are actually ordered uh, instead of randomly disposed. You know, in a glass of water or a cup of water like this, the liquid water that's inside the molecules are bouncing around a gazillion times a second. Uh, actually on a femtosecond time scale and they're randomly oriented and, and, and that's what liquid water is, is all about. But, but uh, scientists over the years have suggested that there's a phase where the molecules are not like that, where actually they're ordered in some way. And there are two people, two remarkable people who have espoused that point of view. And one of them is Albert St. Georgi and St. Georgi uh, is, you know, you know, Beth, but I, I don't, the, the father of modern biochemistry. He won a Nobel Prize, of course, uh, and he discovered vitamin C. And he went on to uh, espouse many uh, revolutionary and interesting points of view, a real hero among, among many, famous for his aphorisms, like, for example, um, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. <laughs> I love that one. Yeah, um, I love that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he also said that uh, uh, discovery is is seeing what everybody else has seen, but thinking what nobody else has thought. <laughs> I like that one too. Uh, anyway, he's a hero of mine with many people, and one of the one one of his. Um, uh, uh, foundational concepts is, is about water, especially water and biology, that the water is different. Water inside your body, inside your cells is different. And the person who uh, uh, spent pretty much his whole life dealing with that issue is the late Gilbert Ling. Gilbert uh, was a scientist from originally from China. He was picked in the first cohort of three people after World War II to come to the U.S. to study. They chose a biologist, a physicist, and a chemist. And the, the physicist went on to win a Nobel Prize, uh, Yang. Uh, and I think he became more, more famous uh, for his um, life outside science than inside science because uh, at, at age, in his late 80s, uh, maybe early 90s, I forget, he married a woman who was in her early 30s. <laughs> uh, his translator, and he became famous for that too. But anyway, it was a group of three, and Gilbert Ling was one of them. And 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 Gilbert uh, was pretty bold in in what he was suggesting, and he had a lot of evidence uh, that inside the cell, that the water was not like um, <laughs> like 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 this water, but in fact the molecules were stacked and organized, um, and it, it it was from there that I got my inspiration from Gilbert Ling. I went to, a, I went to a, a, a meeting and I met Gilbert and I met a dozen other people who had evidence to support Gilbert's point of view. And that, that got me excited, uh, interested, and I came to realize this is so important that I'm going to drop whatever I'm doing. We'd been studying muscles, the muscle contraction, the molecular mechanism. And it seemed to me that this was far more important. If Gilbert was right, then everybody else was wrong. And so I wrote a book called Sales Gels and the Engines of Life, 2001. And the idea was basically to, uh, to elaborate the principles that Gilbert had, had brought 
forth in a way that might be more understandable. Um, Gilbert's writings tend to be a bit uh, uh, obscure and he, he was great about presenting the principles and uh, but those who could understand it were typically restricted to you know a group of uh, uh, physical chemists who could understand uh, what what he was saying. Anyway, I, I wrote the book and of course then we're tempted to study, to look into it experimentally. And so we started and, and what we found, uh, I, may I just show a slide? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Okay. Share a screen, let's see. Yeah. And, oh. and, and this is an interactive lively discussion. So anyone else that has a question or something to add to what Jerry's saying, don't mm -hmm. hesitate to do that please. Yeah. Okay, I, I will share the screen. I still can't share the screen. Uh, okay, I'm trying to give you that option. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. It just makes it easier to uh, show what I'm- There what we I, go. Okay. I think you should be fine now. Yeah, okay. Uh, oops, let me move this over here and um, I can do full screen. Well, I guess I can't. Okay, so here's what we found that's illustrated here. So this is a some kind of material and it has to be a hydrophilic or water loving material of which most substances are uh, and sitting next to water. And we found that that what happens is um, uh, when the water molecule shown here gets some kind of external energy and that is actually from light uh, and specifically infrared light what happens is the molecule breaks and I've shown the break here. It breaks into two parts. Um, one is the positive um, uh, hydrogen that uh, sits here and the other is the oxygen and hydrogen that sits here and it would, would be a valence of uh, minus one. You've got two, two minuses here and one plus. And what happens is uh, uh, this uh, moiety um, uh, tends to accumulate next to uh, the hydrophilic surface mm -hmm. and it builds in layers and these molecules actually organize into a hexagonal kind of array. So you've got the first layer, the second layer, third, and they keep building out here and the positive ones accumulate here. So in essence, uh, you've got a battery because you've got um, negative charge here and positive charge here. And of course, batteries have lots of potential energy. And, and so uh, uh, this, this kind of, uh, water. This is the water that is what we call the fourth phase. It's a, an organized crystalline array and this sits here and um, and the positives uh, sit here. So yeah. this is the water that fills our cells. It was what Gilbert Ling is talking about but we we now have evidence that it's it's a structure that's uh, it's not just the molecules are lined up but there's actually a, a, a chemical uh, transition that occurs that builds these uh, uh, multiple layers. And this is the stuff that's inside your cells, that, that fills your cells. And this is the reason why we believe why the cell has a negative electrical potential. It's not because of um, uh, what exists in the membrane, which is what's in the textbooks, but it's actually the fact that the water that's inside the cell, the water itself, uh, a fourth phase water has negative uh, charge. Um, and so, so this is the stuff that, um, that's inside of us. Um, and, um, in terms of, uh, and just a couple of things I, I want to touch on, I don't want to monopolize. Could I, just, could I just interject for people that maybe don't understand that the negative charge is really positive energy. And, you know, if you might just explain that, I think that would be helpful to some people. Well, yeah, so you can imagine all of these, all of these negatives stuck inside the cell. Uh, they want to get away from each other because, you know, negative charges repel. And, um, and the fact that, that, that these negative charges uh, uh, want, want to go from concentrated to dispersed all over, that's potential energy. And that potential energy is used inside the cell. Uh, um, the, the yeah, and I think it potentially explains a lot of the things that were unable to be explained before. You know, <laughs> how red blood cells are moving into the very fine capillary beds where the energy to propel their motion is coming from. 
Uh, oh yeah, I mean that. Physiological functions in the body are are actually being fueled by this charge separation. Yeah, yeah abso absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that, that that is a, a really interesting story. Of, uh, I mean, about you know yeah. the red red blood cell. You bring up that the red blood cells are uh, twice the diameter of the uh, narrow capillaries that exist in healthy young adults like Stuart. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and so it looks like nature screwed up because why would you, it's like you have a narrow pipe and you're trying to take a, a, a giant ball and stuff it through. And the amount of energy that's required to do that is absolutely horrendous. I first learned that from a Russian <laughs> colleague who told me it was a great big problem. I'd never known about it, even though I began my career studying the cardiovascular system. And so where does the energy come from to, uh, to do this, to and the heart is simply incapable of producing of that much. That. Energy. Yeah, sorry. What? I know. So it, exactly, and so maybe we can have some other people enter into the conversation, like like William, for example. So, so I just yeah. To mention, I just wanted to mention. I mean, I've got a lot of ideas to talk about, but that um, that um, just for the viewers, you know, inside your body, they, you know your cells are that wall that the water is, stru is structuring against. So all the water inside your body is in its fourth phase um, for that reason is because it's water that's enclosed in boundaries and these boundaries are producing this uh, structuring effect and this energy potential. Right. Right. And, you know, as we were talking about in a previous conversation, it's like the water is wrapping around other molecules in, in structured sheaths and, and, inter and, and arranging around our spiraling DNA and helical arrays. And the water is basically, you know, intercalating inside of other t molecules. And we're learning having a profound effect on how the molecules are functioning. And even how genes are being expressed, and 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 now we're learning the charge separation has is is providing some of the energy to fuel chemical reactions and changes in the configuration of proteins and things like that. And so, Joe, did you did you not uh, demonstrate that that boundary condition is much wider? It's much more stacked than we initially thought, right? Oh yeah, uh, because uh, the, this uh, easy water, um, um, yeah, call it boundary condition. The easy water. We have evidence that um, uh, in some in some situations it can extend for as much as on the order of a million layers. That would be like a millimeter or so. We've seen inside the cell. Of course, it's impossible because mm -hmm. the spaces between solids is so uh, is so narrow that. No water molecule is more than, on average, six or seven water molecule uh, um, diameters from any surface. So th that that's why, uh, essentially, all of the water inside the cell is is this uh, uh, fourth phase, or we call it EZ or exclusion zone water. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Maybe you could take us off the screen share so we can see. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, it's let's no see. Problem, no problem. Uh, uh, how do I do that? Stop share. Yeah, stop uh, sharing. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, no. and and you know one thing that interests me so much is the the way when water exists in this fourth phase in the body in this kind of crystalline state, not only do we become a liquid crystal, um, but but I see that there's a parallel between the structure of space memory and the unified field at large. I think one of the the brilliant things that Nassim has has taught us is that. Is that there is pretty incredibly in, in um, detailed structure to the unified field, and there's some parallels in in the structuring. Can you speak about that, Nassim? Yeah, well, uh, in the structure of space time at the quantum scale, um, because you know the water molecules are made out of protons, which are made out of electrons, and um, uh, you know uh, atoms that are made out of electrons and protons and you know, neutrons and all this stuff, and they, they're connecting with each other. And this, um, uh, the, these connections, you, those bond angles, um, 
as uh, Gerald was showing, you know, change in certain conditions, you know, specifically in this case when uh, they're exposed to electromagnetic uh, fields and, uh, and then arranged very specifically. Uh, now, this, um, this is uh, important to, to go a little bit deeper and I'm gonna make that short because I don't wanna take all the time, but it, just that the electromagnetic field is, um, it can be thought as, you know, specific frequency interaction and standing waves and, and so on that would provide structures um, and that this structure that, um, that the electromagnetic field produced is, um, is the result of its own internal dynamics and, and that these dynamics actually emerge from space-time, uh, meaning that there's electromagnetic fluctuations that's occurring at the very fine scale of the Planck scale that define structure that are, are then scaling up you know, you can think as like octaves or uh, resonance pattern in space um, or wave, um, you know, scalar components of waves in the Planck field that produce these uh, dynamics that eventually, you know, um, interact um, with the molecule at that scale and produce the structure and that these have very specific energy levels, very specific bond angles and relationships that, um, that in some ways you could think is transferring information from the Planck field up the scales to the molecular structure. Mm -hmm. And that the geometry of these molecule interaction then provides a very specific frequency of information or uh, flow rate or, or flux of information from the foundation of space-time. Um, so that can lead to, you know, more extrapolation about the structure of water and its interaction in the body and eventually consciousness because you have information transfer. But Lee, could, yeah. could you step in and share some of your insights? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm, I'm it's a little tricky to connect the dots between consciousness and fundamental physics at the Planck scale and water. So I'll give it a try, but uh, be patient with me. Um, so yeah, so our, I haven't uh, uh, worked at my, at my business, uh, the herbal vitamin company for about uh, the last 11 years. What I've been doing for these 11 years um, is uh, work similar to what Nassim does, which is we're simultaneously trying to think about the grand unification between the theory of space and time, which is generally, you know, the best theory there is Einstein's general relativity. And then what, if you look at space and time as the stage, then the actors, the characters playing out on that stage would be the fundamental particles, such as photons, neutrinos, uh, and electrons, right? And that's um, all described by quantum mechanics. And the problem is that quantum mechanics has these deep axioms that imply that general relativity is wrong. And general relativity has deep axioms implying quantum mechanics is wrong. And so really the, you know, the holy grail of genetics, chemistry, and all of the sciences uh, that are floating on top of this missing theory at the very bottom uh, is what you know people work on at the Large Hadron Collider and in groups like Nassim's uh, or my group. Um, there's some similarities between Nassim's ideas and our ideas. Um, for example, uh, we believe that the very fabric of reality is pixelated, like this monitor that we're all looking at. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the pixel is um, the simplest shape in three dimensions, the simplest piece of three-dimensional information, which is a tetrahedron. And if you put four of those tetrahedra together, they form a cube octahedron. Uh, 
which is the shape, the way that you would pack oranges in the supermarket. And uh, Buckminster Fuller called that the vector equilibrium. It's a very special shape. And so in any event, it turns out that water is essentially a tetrahedral molecule. And so when you're thinking of water and you're thinking of its dynamism, you should think about square dancing, where for one moment you're dancing with one partner and then you swing her around and you grab another girl and now you're dancing with her. And so in water, we have this dance, the bond exchange network. And so when we uh, are imagining the Planck scale, um, we imagine uh, the golden ratio coming into play. Again, another coincidental uh, similarity with what Nassim and, and Elizabeth Rauscher and the people who have worked with him uh, believe and see evidence of. And so the way we get the golden ratio in our group, uh, which is the group of about 12 mathematical physicists, and, uh, and, and what we do is we'll take a higher dimensional crystal and we will look at it mathematically, which means we project it mathematically to some lower dimension, and then it becomes a quasi-crystal. And an example of a quasi-crystal is DNA. So uh, the general notion of a quasi-crystal is something that is arranged in a very orderly way, but that that order is not periodic. So when we think about a crystal, uh, like a checkerboard, or the way we stack oranges in the supermarket, that's very periodic. Um, and so what we do is we arrange the tetrahedra in these uh, quasi-crystalline ways according to how we project a higher dimensional crystal. So that's like the, the elevator pitch of our mathematics. Now, the golden ratio comes into play there because the best way to project that higher dimensional crystal is with an angle uh, that is golden because once you use that angle, it brings you into a very special uh, mathematical symmetry group um, where we'll see these beautiful shapes like icosahedra and dodecahedra. So, uh, so, what, so what I uh, think and what I, when the one time that I met um, Jerry was after a, a talk that he did and, and I said, say, hey, Jerry, I mean, don't you think it's possible that this fourth phase of water uh, could be quasi-crystalline in nature? And, uh, and his response was, uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> so that was encouraging to me. Uh, and I've been thinking about it more ever since. So if, you, um, but if any listeners are interested in trying to understand the essence of our work, the best way is to start with our, a video called What is Reality on YouTube. And then if they're interested in reading something, the best paper is called the self-simulation hypothesis. And so the one benefit of taking my tetrahedra and arranging them into quasi-crystal animations or motifs over dynamically is that quasi-crystals are languages in the same way that DNA is a language or a code. And so that just means that you have a finite set of objects like letters, and then you have very strict rules on how you can arrange the letters, but within those rules, you have degrees of freedom called the syntactical freedom of the language, right? And so then you can express all different ways of using a language, like, like how we're using English. So what we think is that at the pixelated scale of reality, which we call the Planck scale, uh, that both time and volume are in these little pixels that are in unimaginably small and that the mathematical objects are these tetrahedra, but that they're dancing according to the strict rules of a language, a very mathematical language called quasi-crystal uh, uh, syntactical freedom in terms of how it can evolve. So, so the self, and then I'm almost done, but the self-simulation hypothesis uh, is similar to the simulation hypothesis. So the simulation hypothesis is pretty simple. It just said, and it's very popular nowadays. The simulation hypothesis says, okay, we're seeing how it's probable that in the future, our descendants are gonna be able to make simulations that are indistinguishable from reality. 
and that they could run what is called an ancestor simulation. In other words, they could run a simulation from the Big Bang or from any other era and play it out along with evolution and playing out everything that would happen in the physical world. In principle, that's possible. And as computational power gets more impressive, more and more people, even, even high level scientists are jumping on this bandwagon. But the problem with that theory that people usually levy as criticism is that, all right, well, if the simulation hypothesis says that it's statistically more probable that we're in a simulation than not, well then, then there's a real world somewhere else in which we are a simulation. So wouldn't they also have to follow the same probability where it's more probable too that they are a simulation? And so you get this turtles all the way down conundrum. The self-simulation hypothesis is, is, a, is a twist on that. And it says, well, is it possible for God or the collective consciousness of the universe to self-actualize itself? In other words, to self-create itself. And one could say, okay, maybe. Now, the way we believe that happened is there's, there is a great consciousness, a collective consciousness, and that great consciousness thinks of self-actualizing itself by thinking about a fundamental mathematical code using sacred geometry. So the sacred geometry extends to higher dimensions. So we use eight dimensions. The crystal of eight dimensions is E8. So, so this collective consciousness, if it was smart enough, could think about a code, let the code play out, and let little quasi-particles emerge from that code that's playing out and self-act upon themselves, begin to self-organize. And as things self-organize, emergent structures emerge. So Nassim and my tetrahedra live below the level of fundamental particles. This is underneath things like electrons, where there's something even more fundamental and simple. So then you get electrons and quarks self-organizing from these tetrahedra. Then you get the electrons and quarks self-organizing into about 100 different types of atoms. And then those self-organize into countless millions of molecules, including DNA, and so on and so on, until you get to Stuart, the very epitome of evolutionary biology, right? And then Stuart then forms groups like us, and we get economies and markets and, and, and gestalts of meaning and thought and meme and religion and, and whatnot. And water. Well, okay. <laughs> so you're nodding your head here. I, know. <laughs> I, think we, I think we need to kind of bring it back to the water. So we think that you can imbue consciousness with, you can imbue water with consciousness. Uh, it's pr probably a, you know, too, too tricky with the time here to talk about how, but in our view, when you think a thought, both your heart with its electromagnetic field and your mind and really your whole body is going to in, it permeate all of the oscillators. That is all of the molecular systems in your presence are going to be influenced with that frequency that comes from your thought. And, and water is particularly vulnerable to encoding because it's made of these tetrahedral molecules that have these degrees of freedom that can easily be manipulated such that you can take some water that has mostly random behavior and you can imbue it with certain frequencies that are biofrequencies that come from your mind and your behavior. And in principle, you can encode that water. And this would explain how you know homeopathy works, but it also explains the more mystical things where you can see somebody bless some water and watch it physical evidence of its physical changes. Yeah. Yeah, Dolph, can you, can you chime in? Oh yeah, I will. Uh, first of all, uh, one of the things that the previous speaker said, I agree with, but let me go back to what we have seen in water. First of all, yes, water can create for us a kind of crystal form. And that crystal form is what we call the coherent state. But there are a number of coherent states. And the coherent state doesn't mean that it is stable. 
it is always dynamic. That's very important. Water is never the same. It always fluctuates. Another thing that is very important in water is that water is a broadband absorber of electromagnetic fields. So it can absorb all the electromagnetic waves from outside. And we know two of them, the sun, it heats up the water. And the other one that is very important is the moon. And they play an incredible important role in water. Wow. Constantly. And what we have built, we have built our complete own devices. And when we measure water, we have seen electromagnetic waves. And a very interesting thing what the previous speaker said, because if water has a certain stability in its coherent state, then, and, and must be really coherent, then you can really get a kind of waveform whereby you can find the golden ratio. The problem is most waters in the world don't have that anymore. Yeah. And we have also seen two things in water. Water can get information, but it should also give information and receive it. It is two ways. And what we've seen, certain waters have the ability to receive information, but they can't give it anymore. And that has to do with the incredible pollution that we have seen in the world. So a lot of the electromagnetic fields that we create ourselves at this moment and all the toxins in the world, they slow down the absorption of the data that water can transport. Because for us, water is a transporter of those electromagnetic fields and it does it in a way it creates a kind of crystal form. Mm -hmm. And it is very interesting to see. We have worked for so many years with all kinds of waters. We tested, I think, thousands of waters. And for instance, we have seen that if you create a coherent state of water, then within 20 minutes, we have seen with EEGs that it has a direct impact on your brain. We've seen that waters have the ability to read immediately to create the connection between the left and the right brain if it has a certain state. And as a matter of fact, I tell you one of the latest research that we have, did, that we have done, and that was done in London um, a month ago, over the last half years, we gave this coherent water to 20 healthy people. And what they measured is that aging slowed down dramatically. Mm. So aging has a lot to do with the water system. And that has to do with the light because those electromagnetic waves that come from outside, from the moon and the sun, they are also connected to your DNA. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. there is a whole of connectivity. And also in your brain, a lot of people do not know that the pineal gland plays a major role in that. And the pineal gland is also a crystal form. Mm. So it is all communication with each other. So yes, it has to do with this, with this field, this electromagnetic field. And we, we really receive now waveforms that we can't explain anymore. And probably they are coming from a kind of, yeah, not known area. And water has the ability to receive that and transport it into the human body. And we also use this water, for instance, to do a lot of testing on the mitochondria. And what we saw is that if you have stable water, then it creates much more effects into the mitochondria. And that has also to do with aging. So water plays in every cell, in every biological system, plays a major role. Absolutely. And we forget it. We are 99% water molecules, our body. And that communication, and Gerald Pollack talked about it, that whole communication, that is one of the most critical areas in our whole health system. And that is yeah. what we see now. And that is why water is so important. And that is why we have to protect water and understand it much more as we do now. Because what I see, uh, we, we use waters and we try to uh, attack the water with other electromagnetic fields. And what you see is that water responds to it and can hold that electromagnetic field for a long period. And it remains there for a long time. And then you see immediately the negative effect into a biological system. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I wonder, Dolph, as you're talking about this, about the energy, the communication, the frequency of water and 5G. It's yes. A, it's a big area that I, I'd love this. Oh, I, I love to tell, uh, and my telco background made me aware that what we do at the moment in this world, we create a lot of wireless systems. And my biggest concern now is that we create wireless systems via satellites. Can you imagine? We have clouds, they create rain. We need that rain and that rain is that water must be stable. Otherwise our harvest will go down. So it will have an effect. If we create satellites and they beam a certain frequency into the cloud and that rain is dropping down on this planet, can you imagine the effect? Mm -hmm. It's right. terrible what we're doing. We are planning to bring in 80,000 satellites around this globe. <clears throat> and that has a huge effect on human mankind. Because yeah. if the water isn't stable, then we will have a problem with our consciousness to bring it up to the next level. And our physiology, because the way, I, the way I saw it with what you were saying is when the water is stable and coherent, I think it, it reminds me of the work of Nassim and William, where it's, it's, it's allowing for greater energy and information transfer at every level of the fractal in the appropriate organization that's going to lead to um, our physiology receiving the right orchestrating information. And so maybe William or Nassim, you guys could could kind of like talk about that, about how water can serve as this amplifier or conduit of energy and information when it's in its structured form. And then the converse of that, when it's in this kind of, it's holding this chaotic, non-compatible, non-biocompatible electromagnetic energy, how that's gonna disrupt the flow of energy and information exchange into the physiology. Yeah, love to hear from you, William. Yeah, um, you know, I'd probably go back to the example that uh, Gerald started with on the, the cup of water. Uh, you know, in that if you think about the uh, molecular structure of the water in that cup, uh, it's mostly randomly oriented and it's zooming around uh, on the dynamic scale of femtoseconds where these, these uh, interactions are taking place. So you can think of it as fairly uh, chaotic. Uh, and I think one of the problems uh, in biology and considering the physiology of the cell is that uh, biologists have thought of water as being in that kind of state in the cell. Uh, and so when you're dealing with what you could call that bulk water, uh, really all it's doing in that kind of say is acting as uh, a kind of medium for other chemical reactions to take place. For instance, you dissolve a solvent in it and the water is just kind of there to act as the medium and it's kind of a very passive substance. And that's how it was thought of in the cellular environment. Uh, and the problem with that is that it just couldn't be further from the actual state of water in the cellular environment in the body. Uh, water becomes a, a very different kind of substance uh, when it's in these kind of like nanoscale confined spaces, uh, when it's uh, interacting with the uh, interfacial su surfaces of the cellular environment, the cell membrane. Uh, and under this uh, condition, this state, water is no longer just a passive medium that you can disregard when you're trying to figure out biochemical interactions, you know, so like how a polymerase enzyme is going to interact with the DNA to uh, replicate it or a transcription factor is going to find a gene, bind to it and uh, make a gene product. Uh, the water under these conditions where it's actually highly structured and it's coherent water, coherent in the quantum mechanical sense, it's act acting as an information medium uh, it, it's involved in the, the uh, information and energy transfer within the cellular environment. And this isn't like a classical information transfer. We're, we're talking about like a, a quantum mechanical type uh, information transfer. Um, so 
there's actually um, a, a real a paper um, I've been researching that I'm very excited about recently, uh, quantum tunneling of water in barrel, barrels of crystal. Uh, this is the title of the paper, A New State of the Water Molecule. Uh, and, and what it's showing is just confirmation that when water is in like these confined nanospaces, uh, when it's in a liquid crystalline orientation, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's becoming like a superposition, literally. And, and th this paper that I just mentioned, they, they, they were measuring this. Mm -hmm. And what it does in that kind of superposition is, uh, so, you know, you've got water that uh, dihydrogen oxide. So, you know, it's got these protons attached to it, these hydrogen moieties. Those protons are just being shared across the entire water coherent domain. Yeah. Uh, and, and when they're being transferred and shared, it's not like in a linear progression through space time. Uh, it, they're, they're like quantum tunneling. Cool. You know, so, so, so th this is qua like quasi instantaneous information transmission. This is the kind of information exchange that's occurring in the cell. Yeah. This is the kind of information exchange that is coordinating uh, protein to protein interactions, DNA to protein interactions, and coupling that water medium with the coherent structure of uh, the field, the quantum right. field, which Nassim has shown is, uh, and uh, our other physicists on the, the panel, like Klee, uh, Erwin, have shown is that, you know, that, that substructure of space, um, uh, uh, can function as like a template uh, for this uh, quantum exchange of information. Yeah, wow. Uh, and really but the only thing that could explain where the coordination of our exquisitely complex physiology is coming from. You know, the, the, the billions of chemical reactions happening in every cell, each of our 37 trillion cells, every second in a coordinated manner. Like that has to be that 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 speed of information transfer to orchestrate all of that right uh, you know self-organizing systems are very very difficult to explain in terms of random interaction in the universe uh, you know all of a sudden producing molecular structures or you know arrangements of minerals and water molecules so that these things start to self-organize and so on Without a source of information, uh, such thing doesn't happen. Now, you, you don't need, what I mean by information um, doesn't necessarily mean that there's a source. Uh, as Clee was saying, you know, it can be self-oscillating uh, uh, crystal because it has feedback, meaning it, it's learning about itself. Um, so there's information flow so that there's information that's emerging from the system, electromagnetic, for instance, and information that's going into the system, gravitational, for instance, and the exchange is producing a self-organizing system that you can think of as a simulation because you're counting bits of information but that, are, that is much more, um, you know, it, a simulation uh, in our computers is really a biomimicking of the natural state, you know, a low resolution biomimicking of the natural state. So the word doesn't really kind of work that great. It's, it's, it's a self-organizing entity transferring information across scales and the water molecule and is the medium in which it's transferring the scale to the biological structure. And that's why biology emerges out of water. It's, it's you know, it's an amazing thing. So, so I, I, water I, and our drinking water change because of all the ways that we have controlled, manipulated and impacted water. How is it different today than it was 4 billion years ago? in every way <laughs> i mean didn't it used to just like percolate up from deep strata you know in the earth through all the different strata becoming imbued with all the mineral frequencies and the geomagnetic field of the earth and then 
bubble up into a mountain stream and then that's what we would drink. <laughs> it's perfectly structured, informed, imbued water that was free of detrimental signatures. Uh, we, that's what is our birthright. That's what we're meant to drink. And so we've got a lot of work to do <laughs> to try to recapitulate that. We, we sure do. And I, I, I just want to go back to the, uh, to the issue of, uh, of memory or information because, because I think there's a, possibly a really simple way uh, of, uh, of understanding it. If you, if you go back to the, to the fourth phase where, where everything is organized, it's uh, liquid crystalline, and um, it, it kind of resembles a computer memory. So, you know, what's a computer memory? Well, it's a three-dimensional array of uh, transistors, and each transistor it could be on or off or zero or one. And, and um, so what you need is some kind of organization, and what you need is different states, and then you have something that's like a computer memory. Well, I think the fourth phase water can actually satisfy that because it's a three-dimensional array, just like the, the computer memory. And uh, not only that, but it, it turns out that, uh, that the oxygens in the array, so you've got oxygens and hydrogens, obviously, which make up the water. And, and the oxygens can occupy not two states, but actually five different oxidation states. Uh, minus two is the familiar one for oxygen, and there's also minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. And you can find this in any chemistry book. It's not exotic or anything like that. And so, so if, you, if you take that into account, uh, the, the uh, fourth phase really satisfies the necessary conditions for having the computer-like memory. However, there's something even beyond it because the fact that it's not two states, but five states means that the information density uh, is possible, at least theoretically, in that is, is many orders of magnitude higher than what we can achieve today in a computer, a computer memory. So if someone can figure out, you know, the mechanism of getting the information in and the information out, uh, we might one day have a have a thumb drive that consists of uh, fourth phase water. And, you know, and, and actually this water can actually be solidified at room temperature. Uh, it, it was demonstrated by Vittorio Elia first in several uh, landmark papers. And in our laboratory, we've been able to confirm uh, using remarkable. different methodologies what, what, what he's seen. So, so this is exciting. You know, it's, it, it, it could be, could be it provide an understanding of why we as bodies uh, uh, um, can can take in the subtle energies that create information and 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 give them out. So uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but at least it's a possibility to consider. Gerald, what does it look like? Water at room, uh, solid water at room temperature. It looks like a little powder uh, or. Uh, um, uh, you know, when uh, Vittorio Elia produced it, he gave us a little container of it, and that container is probably worth more than platinum or something because it takes so long to, to produce. We're trying to produce it uh, uh, on a, a, a more ab abundant uh, uh, basis. And in his case, it was like a, like a thread of, of, uh, of some substance where the thread is wound uh, randomly into a ball. Uh, and ours, uh, is, there's some resemblance, but it's it's more like a powder. You could pick it up in your fingers. This is water we're talking about. Water, solid at room temperature. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, it's it's really amazing. And so it uh, it it kind of um, if you have this thread-like consistency, you pick it up in your fingers and you rub your fingers. It, it disintegrates into a kind of powder. Uh, which I, I guess mean that the bonds are really weak, uh, you know. And We're that, excited about this you, because, uh, you know, lots of people know about information uh, in our body and subtle energies coming into our body uh, with, with information. You know, we sense, I can sense what you're thinking, <laughs> maybe, uh, but your thoughts are complicated. <laughs> so it, it, it presents a kind of a um, bit of a... Um, challenge uh, to 
to to do that. But I think many people understand that we communicate uh, uh, in in uh, in these kind of subtle ways. Uh, we recognize one another. We feel what another is thinking, and it, this could actually, as everybody has been indicating, it could be could could reside in water. So, Gerald, how do they produce the solid water? Uh, well, the way they produce it uh, is through lyophilization, that is uh, like fr freeze drying. You, you take, take the, collect the EZ, put it into a container, put it into one of these machines that draws out the free water and leaves it. And then when you bring that back up to room temperature, you've got EZ and we uh -huh. call it EZ water. And how water do you water. produce it? Well, we uh, we do it that way, uh, first of all, and then we do it another way, and that is uh, just let it dry naturally. Uh, oh. And, you know, it's as simple as ABC, uh, and, and the free water comes off, and what you have left, if you have the patience, and you put it into a heater of some sort, which accelerates the process, and what you have left is fourth phase or easy water. And we know that because we tested afterward to make sure that it satisfies the criteria that we use to define easy water. So you can dry up water. You can dry up water, absolutely. <laughs> you got it. Hydrated uh, water. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's dehydrated water. It's dehydrated <laughs> easy water. <laughs> you can get a whole new product, Jerry. Uh, we haven't been thinking in terms of product. We've been thinking in, in uh, I mean, you could put information, uh, we haven't gotten to that point, but you could put information of all sorts into it, uh, positive information and negative information. Um, and, uh, but, but this has a future to it, I think, uh, a therapeutic future uh, if you put the right information in. But the challenge remains, and we haven't figured it out yet, of how exactly does that information get in, in and then how does it get out? Uh, it's a frontier subject and yeah. one that really excites us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just yeah. add water. Yeah, just add water. <laughs> and Bill, how were you making the coherent water that you were using to, to enhance brain hemisphere communication? <clears throat> You're not at, oh, please, go ahead. You're not asking no, me no. that question. Yeah. No, you are, Gemma? I'm asking you, Dolph. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, it takes a year. A lot of people make coherent water with, with crystals or electromagnetic fields or electricity. And what we have seen is that it doesn't remain stable at all. And not only that, it also is very often focused to a limited number of frequencies. So what we try to do is, the, what we see is that you won't have the full spectrum inside. Because if you focus on one or two frequencies, then it is very often based upon how we think. We think that only those frequencies work. But what we have found is a lot of those frequencies in the other waveform with other overtones, they should be connected to other areas in the light as well. So it's, it's much more complex. So what we did is that it takes a full year with all kinds of me mechanisms and, and forms and without any manipulation. And it has to do also with the electromagnetic waves that take place on this planet. Mm -hmm. That is why it takes a year. But it must be done completely natural. Otherwise, it, 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 it doesn't work. It doesn't have the full spectrum. And how do we test it? We always test it with certain man-made electromagnetic fields. Then we beam that to the water and then we see how it responds. And if it remains stable, then we know that it has a certain coherent state. So it's quite complex. It's, it's not something I can tell you within five minutes. It took us more than 14 years. Wow. It'd be so cool for you to test the water that Nassim and William are, are influencing in their lab with- I'm looking forward to it. I love to do that. I yeah, love to I have a feeling that the, the water treated with the tetrahelix is going to contain all the information because you're basically enhancing the exchange of energy and information from the unified field which contains it all. So can you speak to that, one of you two? Well, that's the thing. It's the, the, you know, I came to the same conclusion. It's great to hear this because mm -hmm. I came to the same conclusion, you know, a while ago that like any technology that's doing the job has to be able to like cohere the field 
at spectra of frequency uh, that is very wide so that it can carry the information at all the different, you know, physical level of the substrate of water, right? Meaning that there's, there's scaling relationships. So you got to scale. And if you're going to scale from the, from the Planck scale, then you better have a device that's somehow interacting with the Planck scale. Um, although all atoms are, so you just got to organize the atoms in such a way that hopefully uh, you get like a cumulative effect. Uh, from the com the Planck scale, just like a bunch of you know iron atoms, which are not aligned, you know, with the dipole all over the place, don't make a large magnetic field. Makes a small one because they all kind of cancel out. If you line them up, all of a sudden makes a big field. So so the idea is like okay, so if you can pull coherency from the Planck scale from the vacuum scale into like a, a substrate that would hold that coherency of atoms because the atoms are interacting with the, uh, with the Planck scale, uh, that you would get a global effect that would extend in space a little bit. And uh, that's how I came up with the, you know, crystal structure because crystals are great oscillators. They're very highly aligned. Um, you know, the molecules are very coherent. You can have very high degree of purities. And that's why we use them in all of our devices, right? They're good oscillators. And, um, and uh, they emerge from water, right? They emerge from the structure of water stacking the atoms together. And um, basically, uh, you could uh, get them in in a state of organization by, by manipulating them a little bit with electromagnetic fields so that they would be just like you manipulate an iron bar to make a magnet, you know, by applying magnetic fields to it, you know, you could apply magnetic fields to a crystal to get it to oscillate in such a way that it would cohere the structure of space a little bit in that region. And when I did that, uh, Initially, for a completely different reason, uh, I noticed that the plants in my laboratory were like going haywire. <laughs> they were growing faster, and they were like, and I, and they were taking less water, and and all this. And then I was trying to figure it out, and then I, I, this is in nineteen nine, you know, ninety nine or so, it's ninety eight. Uh, I figured out, oh. Maybe it's the water, and then I looked into the water, and that's when I got involved with the water structure and so on. And then I studied some of Brian Josephson's, um, you know, Nobel Prize winner in physics for the Josephson's uh, junction, you know, uh, work on structure water, you know, which was really controversial at the time, but um, but it was really exciting to see that emerge. Because I was having the same experience in laboratory and, and thinking the same thoughts. And then, of course, the work of uh, Gerald that came out, it just like blew the doors right open. And, and, and uh, Dr. Montagnier, another Nobel Prize winner that did incredible work in showing memory and water structure. Because people are, it, it's a good point. People are thinking of the water as like this structure that's like some kind of like static field but it's not it, it it is constantly it's dynamic and uh, and it's and it's specific dynamics can be described as specific states that holds information and so you you can think of it as a as an informational structure that that biology emerged from so water was, water is alive nasim <laughs> alive and vibrant so you've talked about the seam about manipulating water. And if we bring it down to sort of earth and our use on a daily basis, all of our water that's being delivered to us is being manipulated. I and like the word enhanced. Like, it, I think, you know, because you're more enhancing it. Right. Well, the point is, can, how do we enhance the water? Because today, a lot of the water is being manipulated. Right. It's let me, being let me, yeah. Yeah, let me try to handle that one, Stuart. So if you think about 
um, the work done by certain scientists um, in Russia and uh, a couple other countries where they discovered that DNA is radiating an electromagnetic signal. So think you've got this quasi crystal called DNA and it's pumping out a stream of photons over time. And those photons are arranged in a non-periodic way, the way uh, a song on an FM radio station is. So it's a waveform, which is something over time. And they don't know yet what the kind of biological purpose is of this coherent light. All they know is that it's non, it's orderly, it has information, and it's not a periodic beat. And it's coming from all of the information in DNA. So when you think about a cell, right, where it, that cell contains DNA and it has a roughly spherical uh, shape with this bilayer, this thin layer, think about how if you take a hexagonal grid and it's on something flat, it can be hexagons all the way. But as you try to wrap a hexagonal grid around a sphere, you get these gaps that can form pentagons like a soccer ball, mm -hmm. right? And so most of biology, uh, like, like the coronavirus, but many, many of the uh, other viruses, bacteria, and, uh, and the cellular structures in our body, um, like DNA, the molecules that build that up, they, they have five-fold symmetry. You know, five-fold is what leads to the golden ratio and these sacred geometric concepts. So what we... Um, what we see is space-time is a fractal structure at this very small scale. And if you wanted to tap in to the information at the Planck scale, you should mimic the geometric motif at atomic scales, which is 23 order, you know, 23 multiples of 10 larger, right? That's where DNA is. But if you, and that is what biology has figured out how to do. It has taken that golden ratio quasi-crystal structure of DNA, and we see no life form on the planet, 100 million species over the 4 billion years, they have all used RNA and DNA, which is that same golden helical structure. So we think that if you, I guess I, I would see that if, let's say Nassim somehow talks to some water, you know, like Emoto style, and he imbues that water with a signal, and then I drink that water, and then that signal that Nassim somehow imprinted into the water would, would now talk to the vibrating DNA that's in my body. And every thought, every action I take makes real-time DNA expression, right? Real-time modulations of the DNA code. So... Mm -hmm. William, did you, did you want to comment on this? That's great. Thank Klee, that was a great explanation. Yeah, thanks, Nassim. Um, yeah, well, I guess, you know, it, it'd be the importance of drinking, you know, high quality structured water uh, and, you know, the importance of that to the biological system. Um, you know, so when you're talking about like water that's been manipulated, you know, like tap water that's had chlorine and fluoride added to it and all these uh, other chemicals and has a lot of uh, other contaminants. Um, you know, th that's gonna wreak havoc uh, when it gets into the biological system. Uh, it's going to interrupt um, cellular signaling. Uh, it's going to interrupt efficient metabolism. Uh, and, and, you know, these are kind of pillars that life and the cell is built on, you know, so uh, the higher efficiency and uh, higher fidelity of, of signaling and energy transfer that you have occurring, you know, in, in the cell at the molecular level with the uh, mitochondria and the DNA and the microtubules, uh, the more vitalistic the biological system is going to be, the more vitalistic uh, the cell is going to be. And, and uh, that's, you know, what we've seen certainly with testing uh, our technologies, um, you know, the, the uh, R-crystal that 
you know, seam is developed. This is a nice uh, cuboctahedral uh, orient orientation, the eight matrix arc, uh, and you know, it's uh, all, all modular. It's, uh, you've got a little tetrahedra. These are truncated tetrahedra. Um, pure crystalline oscillators. And can you show us the helical array behind you? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, as Nazim was saying, you know, these are, are crystalline oscillators. I actually have one that's not in the titanium saddle. Uh, they're floating on little silicone bumpers so that the oscillation isn't dampened. Um, and so, you know, that, that, that's setting up uh, a coherent field, uh, a, a, a field of structured space. Um, and so, you know, we can treat water with that field and instruct the water. Um, and so, you know, when that's brought into the biological system, into the cell, you get higher efficiency uh, information and energy transfer, higher fidelity information transfer. Uh, yeah, we've got um, some pretty specialized uh, constructions for um, actually, it's a little, it's got some weight to it. Uh, uh, you know, we've got some highly uh, specialized. Um, uh, Nassim, were you okay with us showing this technology? Yes, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, you know, this, this is uh, his uh, br brainchild, you know, his baby. I, I don't know, uh, want to make sure he's, he's cool with uh, showing it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so basically, uh, you, you know, you, you've got a, a quartz cylinder here a fused quartz that um, is actually participating in the entire process as well. And inside, uh, you've got a, a helical array of those quartz tetrahedra. Uh, so when you put quartz, and a. It, it, it actually, the, the way that this is uh, uh, engineered, it, it is at the same turn ratio as DNA. Uh, now, uh, so when, when you put tetrahedra face to face, uh, it forms uh, the tetrahelix, mm -hmm. a helical arrangement of tetrahedra. Um, this was actually first, well, I don't know, first described, but it was well described by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, now uh, that, that same kind of helical arrangement, uh, you know, this is occurring in water as well. Uh, and actually, this is just a larger fractal of the structure and geometry occurring in the crystalline lattices of this particular quartz oscillator. Uh, it, it has helical, te tetrahelical arrangements all through it as well. You know, so you kind of have a little bit of uh, structural resonance yeah. occurring there. So, you know, this couples very harmoniously, harmonically w with the biological system the space memory network, the space memory field, what really the, the morphogenic field. Um, and so, you know, passing water through this, uh, you know, the water's gonna vortex around that uh, tetrahelical arrangement. Um, and you're going to get, uh, our testing has indicated uh, structured water. You, you can measure some of the physical chemical properties of the water coming out of this um, and, uh, you, you know, so, some of the, um, the, it's kind of a pre preliminary measurements we've done at this time it has shown uh, increased energy storage within the water. Uh, the, there's actually more energy uh, in the water. Um, and uh, also uh, structuring effects, so uh, higher uh, viscosity, uh, surface tension, um, all showing greater uh, intermolecular uh, tetrahedral coordination of the water. So hopefully we can bring the water back to its natural state, which is, you know, hopefully we can develop. I mean, this is really just the beginning. It's very the baby step. There's so much. And this panel contains so much amazing, you know, potential information that, and technology. I mean, um, I think this should be a very important path uh of evolution for humans right now and investigation and and uh and commitment of uh, research uh because it's really really important i was reading reports about you know 
fertility of uh, uh, humans in, you know, I think yesterday or the day before, uh, like sperm count has dropped 60% across the globe. I mean, yeah. because of- Aaron 5G Brockovich. has a lot to do with that too. Yeah, Aaron Brockovich is, um, the, the article is by Aaron and, and studies have been done showing that um, the way that water has been affected by the PFAs, the forever chemicals, has had a dramatic effect on fertility and now sperm counts and the immune system and uh, testicular and liver cancer. So yeah, what we put into our water has been very, very harmful to us. Absolutely. Um, Nassim and William, I'm very excited about the experiment that you're working on. Uh, and I'd love to kind of keep uh, up to speed with it, but I have uh, something that might help, uh, help you or you could try. So DNA, the winding of the tetrahelix is actually not the same winding as DNA. And you can tell that by putting that tetrahelix in a computer. And if you look at it down its axis, you will see that it never repeats. So it doesn't project to a nice uh, polytope. But if you take DNA and you project it down, you'll find that each of the two strands project, projects to a perfect pentagram or, pen, or pentagon and that the two okay. together are rotated by 36 degrees, forming That's a perfect great. decagon. So if you wanna, if you wanna look at our paper uh, where we have something called a phylix, so instead of a tetrahelix, we call it a phylix. And what we do is we rotate the tetrahedra on their face kissings by this particular angle, uh, 15.522 degrees, which is a golden ratio associated angle, and then Boom, everything lines up perfectly to get five-fold symmetry down the axis um, the way that it is in nature. And so if you want those quartz crystal tetrahelix to talk to DNA, uh, try, you could do an A-B test, where in one yeah. case you adjust it with our angle, and then the other case, see if, see if there's a difference. Oh, that's a, that would be a fun experiment to do. Yeah. Um, and... Um... And yeah, I, you know, this is called the unzipping angle. Um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller had identified that angle uh, yeah. early on. And, um, and this unzipping angle you find in DNA as well. Um, so y there is a relationship. Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It resolved, yeah. So we, we wrote a paper on the unzipping angle. And this 15.5 degree rotation is the unzipping angle. Mm -hmm. so the unzipping angle, guys, is when you take, you know, five, uh, five tetrahedra and you try to put them in a circle sharing a common edge, you'll get a little gap like that that opens up between two of them. And uh, maybe Nassim has a, a, an image. That's the unzipping angle, that little gap right there at the top of his image. So what we did is we said, well, what's the angle to, to make that kiss? And you to, yeah, yeah, you rotate all of them by Buckminster Fuller's jitterbug angle. So if you take the jitterbug angle of Fuller and you rotate those five tetrahedra, then it re-expresses a new form of the unzipping angle, uh, which causes all the faces to kiss and it falls into this perfect five-fold symmetry. And that's the way DNA is arranged. We've gone mm -hmm. from square dancing to jitterbug and kissing. Clee, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a theme. Yeah, <laughs> might end up making babies after all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would love to see is like some really good purification technology first, moving in series into you know something like a, a helical array. I think that we'd become we'd come a little bit closer to recapitulating the water we were meant to drink, particularly if we could then inform it a little bit with some of the mineral, imbue it with mineral frequencies. I think it would be really healthy water. So I'm yeah, committed. Beth, you know, you haven't talked to the some of your experience because you work in the field and you see people and you know you help mm -hmm. people with their health. You know, I'd love to hear from yeah. you. Okay, well, absolutely. I find that that being hydrated is makes an enormous difference with people's health. I think that information just flows better in the body. The joint cushions have more height. The the 
the intervertebral discs have more height, people feel less pain, they think more clearly, they have better energy, you know, so there's all of that. And then I see a lot of neurodegenerative disease in my practice. And one of my therapeutic tools for them is to get them drinking incredibly good structured water because I think it's just helped so much with the brain and the neuronal functioning and cell membrane potential and nerve firing thresholds and all of that. Inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, water is, is like a, it's like a medical prescription for me. <laughs> it makes, it makes total sense because, because the, you know, the, the water participates in every, every reaction that, that occurs in, in the body. The, uh, the, the biochemistry and cell biology books uh, relegate water to the, as, as the background carrier uh, of, uh, uh, of the important molecules of life, uh, like the proteins and the nucleic acids. But uh, they view water as, as nothing more than that. It's just like a, like a bath in which you bathe in. It, it's so wrong. And so your clinical experience makes makes total sense. The water is absolutely necessary for everything. And when we're dehydrated, we can't function. And most of us are dehydrated. But that includes me. That's why I'm drinking this water. I'm currently suffering from a wrenched back. And, uh, and the, the clinicians who are dealing with me uh, sometimes forget to remind me that you got to drink a lot of water. But I think, you know, the experience of many people runs right along with yours, uh, Beth, that the water is critical. We got to drink a lot of water to make sure that we're hydrated, that every cell in our body is properly hydrated because without that water, we can't function. We're dysfunctional. So absolutely, like you say, right on. Thank you. Yeah. So as we're bringing this down to um, back to water and back to earth with water, I'd love for us each to end with sharing what we love about water. Okay. You want to start, Beth? Yeah, I mean, just to, I've spent so much time thinking about water and how to, 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 to improve the health of water on the planet. And in, I honestly feel like water communicates to me, like the spirit, the essence of water, this feminine essence that I, is how I see it. I just feel like it's kind of, um, I, I, I'm serving her, you know, and, and, uh, and then in turn, water has taught me so much. And I, I just, you know, just kind of a sponge for absorbing all the scientific information about water and completely committed to cleaning up large bodies of water, to making safe drinking water available to people. And um, I have all the, the people around me and the resources and everything to make it happen. So I, I feel like I've been appointed by water somehow to, to serve um, humanity. Steward of water. Mm -hmm. William? Did you say William? Oh, sorry. I... Oh, we lost you, Stuart. What, what do you love about water, William? Oh, yeah, well, so water is really at the root of life. So, you know, as a scientist, as an investigator, uh, molecular biologist, biophysicist, uh, I am just deeply intrigued by water. And, uh, you know, the more I research into it, the more and more I realize its central role and being able to explain uh, those most fundamental questions in biology, in biophysics, uh, you know, going all the way to the origin of life, biogenesis. Uh, water was there to orchestrate and organize the primordial chemical reaction networks and uh, th these molecules to, to bring them together and put them into a structured uh, 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 cell before there was a cell membrane, you know, the, the EZ water, uh, uh, the primordial membrane uh, to, to hold uh, the DNA together uh, in a chiral superstructure and uh, uh, intermediate the interaction between protein and DNA that gave rise to the first cells, the first life. Uh, and so, you know, uh, more and more, uh, it's just uh, exciting and astonishing. The more uh, I learn about it, the, the central and pivotal role 
the water plays in uh, understanding the uh, biology of the organism. Uh, it, it's at the root of the physics of the biology of the organism. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not mundane, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the dynamics that are involved here. It's a really fun and remarkable substance. Yeah. Thank you. Nassim? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, what I love the most about water is riding it. <laughs> I, I surf, you know, I tried to surf at least a couple of times a week and I've been surfing in Kauai for a very long time. And, you know, I was, well, a, a while anyway, and I, you know, riding waves is just the most amazing thing. Um, there's totally something esoteric about it because you know, you're riding the energy um, of a wave, but really the water molecules are just going up and down. So what you're riding is like a, a esoteric, almost uh, energy wave that's pushing you along and the speed and it's, it's fun. The, and, and I love, of course, for all the other reasons that we're given, I love water, but I, I but what's, really concerning is you go surfing nowadays and you know you're taking a significant risk in terms of toxicity in terms of you know the amount of heavy material heavy you know um, um, uh, metals that you're ingesting and so on and and radioactive material and and so on and 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 it's it it's quite uh concerning i mean it's non-trivial it's it's significant and um and i think you know with i'm so honored to be talking with you all i i think like it's so great that we're you know we need really good work to be done so we can re-establish appropriate drinking water and 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 not only that like appropriate um you know, biology uh, sustaining systems on our planet, which is very, very much linked to the structure of water and its capacity to be absorbed. Because, you know, Gerald was talking about not forgetting to drink water, and that's really important. And at the same time, if you're drinking water that the body doesn't quite recognize that something that can be used for energy production and transport of elements and all this, then then you still dehydrated, <laughs> you know, uh, because it just won't go in the cells, right? It's just being rejected. And so, you know, this is really, really important body of research you guys are doing, and I'm so honored to be part of it. Yeah. Thank you, Nassim. Jerry, what do you love about water? Oh, I, I, I guess, uh, well, first thing is drinking it. <laughs> uh, second thing is, as a challenge. Uh, so if it, you know, the, the way that uh, cell biology books are written and physiology books, uh, as, a, as I mentioned, water is treated as nothing more than a background carrier uh, uh, of the important molecules of life. If that's wrong, and I believe it's wrong, and I think all of the people uh, on this panel maybe agree with me, then the next challenge is to figure out, well, what exactly is the role of water or fourth phase water, easy water in, in all physiological mechanisms. And on my, uh, on my do list is uh, uh, writing a book on physiology with uh, a different viewpoint with water as the center. And of course, uh, awesome. well, I, you know, I, there's a lot to be learned and uh, but I think uh, some of these mechanisms uh, will turn out to be simpler, uh, a lot simpler. Uh, if, if it's really true that water is the center of, of life and, and uh, mechanistically, you know, Mother Nature works in a simple way and probably the mechanisms are not complicated. They're probably simple. And for me, I love water because it's a challenge and the challenge will be, for me, will be to understand how, 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 how the water uh, plays out in, in as a central 
central player in, in, in the actions of every cell in the body. That's, that's a challenge and that's what I look forward to. Uh, Beautiful, thank you, Jerry. Klee, what do you love about water? Can't hear you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Klee? Okay, <laughs> I've got a geeky reason and, and a spiritual reason. The geeky reason is that for us here at QGR, water as this tetrahedral molecule that creates, you know, these emergent flow patterns with other tetrahedral water molecules, um, it's pretty much for us the closest um, analog to what we are discovering or believing uh, the very fabric of reality uh, at the pixelated Planck scale is like. So that has a lot to teach us for fundamental physics, perhaps. And the more spiritual re, uh, thing I like about water is that I'm a very mental person. I'm a desk jockey, an email guy, and I'm just always in my head. And when I um, get in the pool and I make it a regular practice to be in water every day, like surfers always tell me, it's, it gets in your bones. It changes how you interface with, it makes you flow with other people and with your own self-judgment and, you know, and, it, and so I'm gonna try to stay in water, you know, maybe every day I got this big giant warm uh, thing that's like one of those swimming jacuzzis that's four feet and I'm going in there every day and it's really making my coworkers say that I'm easier to work with since I've been doing that. So. Thank you, Clee. You're, you're emotional and being more like water. Yeah. And Dolph, what do you love about water? Well, I think that when you really want to understand life, you also have to understand water. Uh, because water is so deep, we think it's only H2O. But if you really go into the research, as we, as we all do, if you really go into water, you think this is amazing. How is this possible? This is really a living system. It has a consciousness of itself and it can respond to itself. So it makes you incredible humble. You think, oh my God, I really know nothing. This is something so big, so exciting. And it is also a little bit strange that we call this planet Earth. It was much better if we would call it water. Yeah. <laughs> yes. it, cre it creates life. And yeah. that is why we are. Our body is water. We are with water. Bodies. Of, we are water bodies with a lot of bacteria, and that's it. <laughs> and it, it creates also a consciousness. I mean, let's 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 be honest. If you go to all the religions in the world, everybody baptizes it with water. Why? Because you make the connection again. So water create that connection, and that is how we started. We started this discussion, what has water to do with consciousness? It creates again that connection. And that is why I think water is so important and we should not underestimate it. And it is so important that we should understand water much more in depth as we do now. Thank you, Dolph. Thank you so much. And uh, perfect appropriate timing for me as I'm in Kauai and living in the place that has the wettest place on the planet and it is raining right now <laughs> and so um i am grateful and as as many of you said humbled by water and its power its generosity and i just love how water gives and gives and gives and asks for nothing in return and is the most incredibly complex compound that we all are trying to understand or connect with and really be one with and come back to self because as we just said we are water yep. and so we all are connected in water and this is water is the uniting element that will bring us all together on this planet to open up our hearts and to love each other and love ourselves and that's what we need especially at this time all right yeah thank you for organizing this Stuart. uh this is a, a great great session wonderful yeah no. Stuart, thank you all right it's our pleasure thank you all and um remember 
Monday's World Water Day. We've got lots of events for that. And um, we'll be sharing that with you all and look forward to us continually working together and exploring more into water and going deeper together into the water. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. So Bye. great to be with you guys. Bye.